Okay, so today we're going to be looking at different file types in bioinformatics. So as you might have seen yesterday, there are many different file types, and you use different programs to open different kinds of files. So we are just going to take a look at the more common ones that you're going to encounter when you do bioinformatics and analysis. Just to kind of make sure that you get a feeling from when in a pipeline you should see different files, because the raw data is only in the beginning of the pipeline. It's very seldom in the middle or in the end. You kind of refine your data more and more, and at the end you have like a CSV file of SNPs or something. So you don't bring back your sequencing data for the final steps, usually. So the problem with standards of in file formats in bioinformatics is that there are so many of them. And there's new ones coming along every now and then as well. And then you have to still support the legacy formats. And yeah, then you just have a big mess out of everything. So it can be quite overwhelming at first to see all these different file formats. And you just see the file endings. And eventually, students will start trial and error, try just to put different files into the program, see when it starts running, when it stops crashing. So we're just going to look at these file types today. So FASTA, that's reference sequences, like a reference genome. And then you have FASTQ, which is reads in raw format. Then you have SAM and BAM files. Those are aligned reads always. And then you have CRAM, which is they are pretty much the same as SAM and BAM. They're also aligned, but they're smaller. And then you have uh, different annotation formats, like GFF and uh, BED formats. So we're going to take a look at the FASTA format. Has, have you seen this before? Yeah, this is a very old format. It's been around for, I don't know, wouldn't surprise me, more than 25 years. And it's used for reference sequences. And it can be either nucleotide or peptide sequences. And it's a very simple structure to it. You have something called a header row, which is where you type the name. And it starts with this greater than symbol. So as you see here. And you can type whatever you want on this row. The program won't really care. It's just the name of the sequence. And then on all the rows following that row, we have the actual sequence. So it can look something like this. So here, they wrote this species, species and the location where the sequence is from. And here, you can just type whatever text you want. And the computer doesn't mind. And as you see here, all this sequence belongs to the header row above. So it knows that, okay, so this is Homo sapiens chromosome 17. Okay, all the way up until here, the next header row. Then it knows that, okay, so now this sequence is finished. And then the next one begins. So it's very easy to keep track of which sequence belongs to which header. And if we look at the FASTQ format, it's quite similar in structure. So instead of this greater than symbol here, they have the at sign to signify this is the header row. And same thing here, you can type whatever you want after this at sign. It's just the name of the sequence. And then comes the sequence itself, just like in the FASTA file. But then you have this separator because FASTQ contains reads in raw format. And reads, they also have a quality connected to each base. So it's pretty much a measurement. How certain is the sequencer that it read correctly on this position? So it can look something like this. So here you have the first header here, sequence 001, then you have all the DNA, then you have the plus sign to say this is a separator between the sequence and the quality, and then you have this line, which is the quality scores for each base here. So they have an intuitive feeling, is percentage sign a good quality of a base or not? No, it's not that easy. So the problem here is that we have qualities ranging from zero to 40. So 40, that's two digits, right? So how do we get two digits to point to one single nucleotide here? So it knows that, okay, so it's 40 pointing to that one instead of four pointing to that one and zero pointing to that one. So we have this problem that it, they will be uneven lengths if we use two digit numbers to describe the qualities. So they wanted a way to compress two digit numbers into one single character. And then you can use something called the ASCII table. So this is just a computer thing. Like every single character you can type on a computer has a corresponding number to it. So you can look here. You see the ones here in the beginning. It's like start of heading, 
acknowledgement audible bell. So there are lots of characters here in the beginning that you can't really type in a file. You can't really type this audible bell. So they had to shift everything until you reach these printable numbers up here. So I think exclamation mark is the first one that you can like print and actually see. You can print a space as well, but it looks like nothing. So they decided they wanted to shift everything. So quality score zero will be here on the exclamation mark. So if you see exclamation mark, you know that's quality score zero. It's really bad. And quality score one will be here and two, three, four, five, and so on. But of course, they couldn't decide on one single standard how to do this. So we ended up with a couple of different ones, depending on when you sequenced your uh, data. So some of them, the original Sanger sequencing, uh, when they wanted to add quality scores in files like this, they used the FRED score, that's the quality score, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And they added 33 to reach the exclamation mark. And usually it ranges between 0 and 40. And then Solexa came along and said, now we're going to add 64 instead. And the quality score can range from minus 5 to 40 and so on. But I think it's stabilized mostly now around this Illumina 1.8 that I add 33 and it ranges from 0 to 41. So these are like super detailed things. You don't have to remember this. This is just like a historical uh, explanation of how the file format works. So and that's why we end up with all these really weird characters down here. So we see, oh, that must be a really bad base. It's exclamation mark. I don't remember which one was the super good quality. So 33 plus 40, that's 73, right? Capital I. Do we have any really good bases here? No. Maybe it was a really crappy sequencing run. And I'm pretty sure I was the one who uh, just synthesized this data by picking random characters in this range. So usually reads that have really good quality all the way in the beginning, and it's towards the end they start getting really bad quality. So in these quality scores, they range from uh, 0 to 40. What does that mean? So it corresponds to a probability. So according to score 10, for instance, that means that the error rate is 1 in 10, so 10% 10 error. So the accuracy is 90%. And quality score 20 is 1 out of 100 basis is wrong. So we want to be up here at around 40 or like above 35 so that we have like 99.9 .9 something percent accuracy. Because if you don't have really good accuracy, you can't really go do good SNP calling, because then it might just be a sequencing error that you see. So then we have the SAM format. So after you have the FASTQ files and you align them to a reference genome, which is the FASTA file, you will end up with the alignment results. And most alignment results nowadays is stored as SAM or BAM files. So this is used for only aligned data. So this format is a bit complex. It contains a lot of columns, and it's not meant for humans to read it because it's yeah, just confusing. So here's the specification of the format. So you can see that there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 columns containing a bunch of different stuff. But I, yeah, oh, that's not good. Should be an image there. No? Hmm. It's an image of uh, a SAM file, so you can see all the columns. Just imagine that you see like a big Excel file with lots of columns. And I will point that it's only really the first column that contains this uh, sequence name or the read name. You know, whatever said after the at sign in the FASTQ file, it will take that name and put in the first column. And then, then we'll print out where this read mapped in the reference genome. So which chromosome and which starting position. And over here, you would have two columns, one with the sequence. So everything that was in the sequence place in the FASTQ file, and then the quality. So everything that was in the quality place in the FASTQ file. And then you would have loads of different other information, which looks really weird because it's not meant for humans to read. It's just parentheses and uh, numbers and exclamation marks. So it looks really confusing. So then we have the BAM format. 
which is exactly the same thing as the sound format, but it's also compressed. And if you compress things in a computer, usually when you compress text files, they uh, get compressed down to 25% of their original size. So that means that you only need 25% of the hard drives you usually would need to store all your sequencing data. And hard drives get expensive eventually when you need lots of them. So it's very easy to, co to convert between SAM and BAM. There are formats that can do this on the fly and it won't slow down your uh, uh, analysis speed. And one important thing with the BAM format is also that you can index it. So what is indexing? Have you seen this before? Have you ever used one of these? Well, then you used an index. This is exactly what the BAM index is. It just says where you can find stuff in the BAM file. So you don't have to start from page one and just look for, okay, where do I find the information about the grep? It's not first page, no grep, second page, no grep. It will take a while. Instead, you look at the index and see, oh, grep, oh, it's over here, page 27. Then you just jump there directly. So as you can imagine, you would be much faster if you had an index for the book. If you have to look up random words in the book, you would just see, okay, grep, okay, there it is. Same thing with the BAM file. The computer will not even try to analyze a BAM file that is not indexed because it will just take you know a million times longer time. So why waste time doing that? Because then you would have to read like on average half the BAM file every time you wanted to fetch something from it. Ah, now the image works at least. So BAM files are unordered when you first uh, produce them because all the reads that you get from the aligner, those were fragmented in a test tube and then you pour them on a glass plate and then you started taking photos of them. So they are gonna be in a random order. And then when you have the FASTQ file, that's the same order as the sequencer read them in, and the BAM file will be in the same order as the FASTQ file, because it will take the first read from the top of the FASTQ file, find the alignments, and then save it to the BAM file, and then we'll just add them one by one. So the first thing you have to do before you can index one of these BAM files is that you have to sort it. So then you will use a program called SAMTOOLS sort. That will just align or sort all the reads in the order that they are aligned in. So chromosome one reads and then within chromosome one, the starting position and so on. Because once you have done this, you can start indexing and say that, okay, so here starts chromosome one and here starts chromosome two and three and four. So when the program then wants to fetch all the reads from chromosome four, it can just jump here directly. It doesn't have to search through all these reads. So usually you start off with an unsorted BAM, you use some tools sort to get a sorted BAM, and then you use some tools index to index this BAM file. And as you can see, nothing has changed with the BAM file. Not a single bit of this BAM file has changed when we indexed it. The only thing that happened is that it created a new file called exactly the same thing as the BAM file with dot by BAM index at the end. So if you want to unindex a BAM file, you just delete this index file. You don't have to touch the BAM file. And as soon as you modify the BAM file, you have to re-index it because then it doesn't match the index anymore. It's kind of like a book. If you remove some pages, then it's not going to make sense. Well, I guess page numbers are written a number at the bottom, which wouldn't change if you remove a page in the middle. So then we have the CRAM format, which is even more complex. So someone sat down and thought, well, isn't it stupid that we save all data from all reads when they are matching the reference genome? Can't we just say it matches the reference genome instead and just save the differences? So they set out and do that. So to do this, they use something called a reference-driven compression. So they will see that, okay, so we have this read here. It matches to the reference genome on this chromosome at this starting position. And then it matches all the way up here, but there are two differences. So a G and an A in position two and 18. So then it only have to save starting position, stopping position and differences. And reads usually are not this short, they're about 150 base pairs nowadays. So if you have a matching read that matches completely to the reference genome, then you just have to say the starting and ending position. And then you don't have to save all these other 150 characters. So that really brings down the size of the uh, CRAM file. The only downside is that you have to keep track of which reference genome you used when you did this compression. 
but yeah, I, I'm pretty sure they're like write it in the inside the CRAM file the name of the reference genome that was used for creating it. So how do you do with the quality scores then? Because we don't have a reference for the quality scores and they are pretty much random. So there are three different modes you can run this CRAM compression with. It's a lossless, bind, and no quality. So no quality, that's the easiest one. You just throw it away. You don't save the quality. And the lossless one is also quite easy. You don't do anything with the quality. You just save it as it is. But you have a problem when it comes to compression algorithms and computers is that the more complex your data is, the harder it is to compress it. So if it's super uncomplex, so it's only one single character repeated 10 million times, it's very easy to compress that. You just say, repeat this character 10 million times. As soon as you get more different characters, it starts getting more tricky. So if you can just bring down the number of different characters in your string, it can compress easier. So that's what this bind approach is all about. So imagine that you have quality scores like this. You have this gradient ranging from zero up to 41. Is it really important to know if the quality is 38 or 37? Probably not. I mean, it's a good quality read. You want to be able to tell apart the reads that are quality score 35 and above from the ones that are 10 and below, because you don't want to keep the really bad ones. So this binning approach, I think they use eight bins as default now. So then they just said, okay, so all the reads with quality scores between one or zero and five end up in this bin, and they just call it five. And all quality scores between six and 10 end up in this bin, and they just say it's all tens. So then you bring down the complexity because then you only have eight different characters instead of 40. So then it's much easier for the computer to compress this. So then you can decrease the file size even a bit more. And you don't really lose that much data. You still know if it's a good read or if it's a bad read. So I did a test. I had a SAM file, which was uh, yeah, seven and a half gigabytes. And I tried compressing it, first just converting to a BAM file, then it was about 1.9 gigabytes. So just there, I saved 75% of hard drive space. So then I started doing more. Okay, so what if I do this lossless cram compression? And then it shrunk maybe 25% more. And then you use this eight bin approach, and then it's only 700 megabytes. And if you toss all the quality scores, you I think it was 250 megabytes. But this 8-bin approach, I mean, that's almost a 90% reduction in file size, meaning that 90% reduction in storage costs when you want to store your sequencing data. And on Opmax, we bought a storage system for 5 million. Imagine if everyone were using these crown files. We could have bought like yeah, 10 times more. The only downside with crown format is that not everyone is using it. And I would say it's always possible to trick your programs into using CRAM format, even if they don't support it. You can use uh, Linux commands in Bash to like convert it on the fly to BAM format. So even if you have a picky program that only accepts SAM format for some reason, you can always make sure that whatever ends up into the program is SAM format, but whatever you have on the disk is CRAM or BAM or whatever format you want. So if someone says that, no, it has to be SAM, no, no. You can always get around that. So then we have the annotation formats. So annotations is kind of like if you have a map without any text on it, it's just an aerial photo. It doesn't tell you that much. It's when you start adding text to it or annotations to it, then it starts making sense. Then it says Uppsala on top of this town. Then you know, oh, okay, so this town is Uppsala. Of course, lots of columns in this format as well. So every line in this format is one feature. It could be a gene or an exon or something like that. So if you look at the bed format, for instance, all this format contains the same information. It's just how many columns they wanted to divide that up in and what to name the columns. But if, it all ends up with a position and some information about that position. So in bed format, you can have between three and 12 columns. The first three are mandatory, and that's the chromosome and the starting position and the stopping position. And then the rest is just extra information. So if we look at the uh, specification of the bad format, the fourth one could be the name, which is good if it's a gene or something. Then it's a score, it's like how certain is the uh, feature finder. I don't know what the class of programs is called that 
generate these kind of files. But yeah, how certain is it that it actually guessed correctly that this is a gene? And then which strand? And here you have uh, some plotting information. So if you've ever looked in a genome browser on a gene, you know that the uh, the exons are thick bands and the introns are really thin bands. And this is where the thick starts and the thick ends. So it's kind of like, where should I plot the exons? And then item RGB is like, which color should I use for this plotting? And then you have some other stuff where we have block count and sizes and starch. And then GFF looks pretty much the same thing. It starts with the name instead. And then it has a column for which source it is, which program generated this feature, what kind of feature it is, starting position, ending position, score, strand, and so on. And over here, you can have uh, as many key value pairs as you want. So ID equals gene and name equals Eden. So you can squeeze in whatever you want there. And this image is broken as well. So now you know everything you need to know about file formats. So now when you see a FASTQ file, you know that, okay, so these are the raw reads. So if you're going to do an annotation step, you're probably not going to put in the raw reads. You're probably going to be using the line reads. So then you know that, ah, oh, okay, so probably the BAM file should go in here, or even better, the CRAM file. But now we're going to do a small lab on this. And yes, we're going to do... Like, I think it's an alignment and uh, maybe snip calling and some RNA seq alignment with like fake tools that run quite fast and always give a good result. Uh, and just look, try to think about where you see different file formats. It's not really important what we do when those, but try to just see, okay, so the FASTQ file is here and the BAM file is here and you end up with a CSV file, I think. So same thing as yesterday, just go to the course homepage and uh, start doing the lab and raise your hand if you have any questions.